This is a class on the human attachment project, part of birthing the future. And because I tend to talk in a kind of circular way rather than a linear way, I'm going to be pulling pieces together which as we complete the class you'll see all, all fit, but may not all seem to make sense at the beginning. When we talk about the body, we're really talking about the earth. What I really want to do is awaken things inside you that touch your heart or settle in your gut and say yes. Reaffirm what you already know and maybe add a couple of things that might connect one piece to another. And in preparation for it, I found myself reading more and more and more about neurotransmitters and hormones and microbiome and you know and it's like yeah okay and that's not really going to change people's lives except in that we understand the complexity of the human body and how the many parts work together in a symphony you know the billions of cells and it, it's it's just quite amazing and I think we've lost sight of that as we've become more and more disconnected not just from ourselves but from the earth so I'd like to start by reading you a blessing by a man I really love John O'Donohue a poet and philosopher from Ireland and you'll have to forgive me if I lapse into a bit of an Irish accent because it tends to come with the poem <laughs> It says, may you awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. May you have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. May you receive great encouragement when new frontiers beckon and respond to the call of your gift and find the courage to follow its path. May the flame of anger free you from falsity. May warmth of heart keep your presence aflame and may anxiety never linger about you. May your outer dignity mirror an inner dignity of the soul. And may you take time, I wanna repeat that, may you take time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. May you be consoled in the secret symmetry of your soul and may you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. Wonder is one of, it's one of the traits that human beings come in with. Wonder and curiosity and desire to learn everything, an unquenchable thirst. And as we talk about the body, I'm going to have to take us back to the Industrial Revolution in uh, the 1860s and even before then, but let's say the 1860s, when the promise of machines was so exciting for adults that we lost sight of what it was to be really connected to each other, to the land, to our own soul. And we began to think that machines and everything that we could create of an industrial sort would free us, would make our lives easier. And over time, without realizing it, although there were many benefits, from our machines, you know, we wouldn't want to go back to a time without cars or back to a time without our phones. Each one of them took a piece of us with it. And over time, we became enslaved to the very machines that were supposed to free us. So you find first factories that had to be kept going 24 hours a day in order to produce something. And then you had to have people who would work 24 hour a day, whether they were working 12 hour shifts or 24 hour shifts. Suddenly they weren't home for dinner 
And they weren't in the fields. They weren't able to be with the baby. Baby was left behind in the care of somebody um, who was perhaps an immigrant to this country and didn't even speak English had her own children, maybe many of them, but were taking care of our children so we could go work in the factories. And after a while, the children began to work in the factories too. And it was a long time coming before child labor laws were put in place, where the mothers of the country began to wake up to the insanity of having young children working in factories. And of course, still across the world, you'll, you will see places where children are literally, or were in the last years, chained to the loom on which they were making a carpet and working there for pennies a day. And that was their life. So I, I want to take us back to that because we've grown so accustomed to the life that we live and the speed at which we live, and the rhythm at which we live, which is not the rhythm of the human body, that sometimes it's easy to forget where all this came from. We tend to think we're lucky to work eight hours a day, but in fact, the average American is working 49 hours a week and commuting on top of that. And many people, at very low wages, get no holidays, no paid vacations, work right through, and have no, uh, no time off at all, really, working two jobs in order to pay the rent and, and have the food. Now, way back, we lived in communities where children were raised by everyone, where in tribal groups, for example, the children played in the center of the circle or played at the periphery and everybody watched the child. And it wasn't so difficult to be a parent in those days because we weren't so alone. But what we have now is the size of what we call the nuclear family shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller without elders and grandparents and aunties and neighbors who we've left behind as we moved with our job or as we moved to a new country. And uh, children are being cared for and reared by two parents if they're lucky or one. And that one parent is more and more exhausted, sleeping less and trying to do the very best he or she can for their child. So what we have is children getting not just the best of their parents, but they're getting the worst as well. And this is in large part a direct result of the disconnection from our body as we embraced more and more of a factory-based and then consumer-based uh, economic system. So I probably don't have to tell you that at any given moment in the day, you are likely yearning to be somewhere else, or at least once an hour wishing you could be somewhere else, wishing you could be outside, wishing you could be swimming, wishing you could be taking an art class, wishing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, if we understand that the rhythm and pace of the human body and and of the human heart and soul require a certain amount of rest and nurturing like this and move like this, then it's much easier to understand and be compassionate toward our sense of exhaustion and frustration with our exhaustion and sometimes feelings of guilt and shame about the fact that we're frustrated about how exhausted we are, right? <laughs> I remember a woman telling me once that yeah, our eight hour a day jobs usually take about 20 hours of our energy. So by the time we get home, there's, there's not much energy to do the things that would really nourish us, which might be getting on the floor with the kids and playing. It might be taking a walk, and instead we plop ourselves down in front of the computer or the TV and watch something mindless, which actually just hyperstimulates the brain even more. And I know this for a fact in my body because when I get overtired, I start to get frantic. And when I get frantic, 
then I go for more stimulation instead of stopping having a glass of water or taking a warm bath or taking a walk for a block you know that that's what happens and that's a direct result of the hyperstimulation of the brain and of the hormones of stress that are coursing through our body so I wanted to start today by saying wherever we are there is absolutely no blame no guilt this is I'm this is a result of a way of life that human beings have created over the last few centuries. And most of us don't have time to even question why they're this way, how they got to be this way, and could they be different. Women know this because we have to live in our bodies because we have our menses, we have our cycle. and along with those hormones come all kinds of emotions. So we know when we need to rest, but often it runs completely counter to the workday or what the kids need and who needs to be driven here and what we need to do in order to get that so that everything falls into place. So I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that we have broken apart life and the human body with first the microscope and then the electron microscope and then the, the microscopes that allow us to see tinier and tinier and tinier pieces of things so that we're seeing bits but not the whole. So that we actually think that enriched flour is better than grown organically. And what it is actually is a form of food from which almost every nutrient has been stripped and then it's been bleached to make it white and then a couple of inert substances known as vitamins and minerals have been thrown in and it's called enriched flour. And uh, we're not to blame for taking in the ads that come at us all the time that tell us that our lives should be better, that we should be doing this, that if only, you know, we had our hair done in that style, if only our heels were that particular height, that then we would be really lovable, right? Men have their own version of this. Mm -hmm. If only they were a better provider, if only, if only they produced more. It's all about production. But that's not what the human body is and the language of the body is our senses it's our senses it's where we live in the feelings in our gut the feelings in our heart the feelings the sensations in our sore feet and if we want to have lives that hold the kind of meaning and deep satisfaction that we yearn for then we really have to understand what is our body and our brain? What, what's it designed for? First, first thing I want to say is that separation has been the way of life in modern society for over a hundred years. Separation from self, from other, from the earth. So I want to, I want to give you an example because the mother baby are one system from conception to about nine months after birth, at least that 18 month period of time, during which we, we, we often call it the in arms period, or though most babies don't get to be in arms so much anymore. But during this period of time, what you do to one, you do to the other. And if after birth, it's not the mother caring for the baby primarily, but another figure, it could be another woman, could be grandmother, could be dad, it's the same thing, they are one system. But the system is built on the biological mother baby that they, happens when the woman is pregnant and the child is growing in the womb. Here is like at the core 
of an example of how our modern industrialized way of doing things has shifted our very nature. Oxytocin is considered the love hormone and it does many, many things in the human body. It'll, it does things like contract the uterus after birth so the mother doesn't bleed too much. It, uh, it's an amazing hormone. If the oxytocin response doesn't develop in a healthy way, you may later on in life fall in love without loving, you may marry without loving, you may die without ever being loved. Now we use this word love very, very often, but do we really know what it means? Oh, I love that dress. <laughs> love. There is a difference between this kind of love and the kind of love that the Greeks called agape or altruistic love. Love in service. Love in service of a higher good. Agape. I don't even have to write that down. But the kind of love that we often talk about is superficial. There is another kind that comes with oxytocin and other hormones. It's called attachment. And that, or bonding, that is a very physical kind of love where if your partner, the one you love deeply, or if a baby that you have and you're really deeply connected to it is taken, a couple of blocks away, you physically feel pain. You physically feel that. When a child is securely bonded, by that I mean full healthy bonding, which starts right at birth, secure, then that child will cry when mom leaves the room. If that child is put in in daycare, at three weeks, six weeks of age, even six months, when mom walks out or whoever is the primary person in that child's life walks out of the room and goes to work, that child will cry and cry and cry. When mom comes back eight hours, ten hours later, and that child is, let's say, playing, let's say it's a six or eight month old child, and the child does not look up. People say, this is how they describe it, oh, he's such a well-behaved little person, you know, or she's such a good little girl. No, actually, she's given up on mom. That's why she doesn't cry, and that's why she doesn't look up. When mom or dad, who's the primary person, walks into the room, there's this sense of hopelessness. What we, what we call it psychologically is learned helplessness. And it's something that happens when we feel that our needs are not going to be met and that nothing that we do matters we go into a state of resignation, learned helplessness. Help, whoop, less. Helplessness. This starts right from the way we do birth. But even before that, when a woman's in a high stress chronic state of stress in pregnancy because she's in a society like ours that has no universal guaranteed paid maternity leave. Only modern, modernized culture in the world that doesn't. Um, she's worrying often about what she's going to do for childcare when she's six months pregnant. She's starting to detach from the baby she hasn't even seen in order to think about the survival of the family and of this baby. Women are very good at that because women are built for the survival of the species. So learned helplessness is one of the responses that the 
primitive or ancient part of the brain or the brain stem will, will have in order to cope with a very difficult situation. There are two others, fight or run away. And um, when I, I have to talk about this in terms of the language of the body because so much of what we're doing in modern life has disconnected us from our own emotions and feelings and senses and sensations that would give us the signals, the signals that that really didn't taste good, or it did taste good, but it didn't really feel good in my gut. Or it felt okay, you know, it was okay in my gut, but I feel like I have like an iron ball in my gut. And then I can't go to the bathroom the next day, I'm constipated. But we override it because we take something for the constipation, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're constantly blasted with ads for things that will fix the symptoms that are really the language of the body that says, shouldn't have eaten that, you know, or I really did need to eat. And now we know that in fact, the hormones that are produced in the gut are directly connected to how we think. It's called the gut brain connection. And we now know that what we call the microbiome, which is crazy word, but it's all the microorganisms that grow in a particular environment that are suited for that organism. That, so the microbiome that the baby's going to go home to after a birth in the microorganisms of the place where the mom lives. And yet, if that baby is born by cesarean, or especially if that baby's born without even any contractions, uh, you know, a scheduled cesarean, no contractions, no stimulation of the nervous system of this, of this baby in a rhythmic way to get it, its heart to be working well and to ready it for breathing and, you know, taking this huge breath of air, then that baby's gut is colonized because it's a sterile field, colonized by the microbiome or the microorganisms of the delivery room. But it's not gonna live in the delivery room. So what does modern, modern technology say? Because we're not gonna get rid of the cesarean now because it's a profit-driven industry and there's a lot of reasons why we do 10 times as many cesareans as are needed. So we're going to create a tampon-like thing that has the vaginal secretions from the mother's vagina and we'll wipe it around the baby's nose and put it in the baby's mouth to give it some of her gut microorganisms. Well, it's kind of like enriched bread, isn't it? Or enriched flour. It's not the whole picture. <laughs> But it's, it's in an industrial society, in a society that's taking apart everything to its smallest bits and pieces, then it looks like that's a solution to a problem. But unfortunately, the problem itself was caused by something else we did, or maybe three things we did all the way back. So to get people to think about these issues is very difficult because it usually brings up feelings of I did it wrong, especially in women, because women are socialized to feel guilt. And women are socialized by the use of shame. Men feel it too, but when it comes to kids, it's the mother who usually goes, ooh, I did everything I shouldn't have done, or I knew, I knew when I, you know, when I, gave that baby a bottle the first day and because I was going back to work and I decided not to breastfeed. I, something in me said it wasn't the best thing to do. And yes, he has a lot of allergies and it's all my fault, right? So it's really hard to talk about this stuff, to talk about nature, to talk about the human body, to talk about the fact that our body has certain needs and that we are just riding right over them, right and left in modern society. So if there's anything I can say to parents who are listening or health workers or people growing up who are old enough to know how they were born and whether or not they were breastfed and did they sleep in a separate room and where they picked up when they cried, it's, it isn't your fault. This is the way society is organized. And our job is to figure out 
what we're going to do about it, living in this kind of society and changing this society. Because it happened in steps over a period of time, and if it grew this way, then it could grow a different way. Just like we could grow a form of capitalism that actually put the workers first, we could, instead of greed, um, we could grow a system that honored the work of nurturing, that honored the work of women, the work of homemaking, the work of mothering, the work of cooking, whether it's done by a male or a female. And we could start including that as part of our gross national product and valuing the work of caring for the human soul and the human body. So one of the hormones that's so important is oxytocin. But it's not the only one. There are so many that are very important. And there's dopamine, there's adrenaline, there's cortisol, and they all do different things. And in a well-orchestrated body, in nature where everything is fitting together, they do them at just the right time. But instead, most of us are what we call upregulated most of the time. We're in a state of on, you know, hypervigilance, on, hyperreactivity, and intense focus, and it's exhausting. It's exhausting to the brain, it's exhausting to the body, and our kids are watching us, and they're modeling themselves after us, and if that's the way we are, then that's the way they want to be. And so what they learn is to shut off their own sensations and feelings of, well, where's my dad? Or where's my mom? Or what happened to me? Or this really hurts when somebody is saying, now, Johnny, that didn't really hurt. Just put a Band-Aid on it. We've got to go. We've got to get in the car. Right? Mm -hmm. Whew. So after a while, child begins to not listen to the cues of his own body or her own body, which are physical sensations and emotions, and to disregard them. And if we disregard them long enough, we'll get all kinds of symptoms that, you know, we call chronic conditions that um, are basically our body's way of saying, help! <laughs> Excuse me, is anybody out there listening? You know? Ooh. So, I think the most important thing I could say about the language of the body is that it is the true language. It is... Yeah, it is the true language. It's telling the truth. And as we begin to listen to it, which means as we begin to slow down enough and pace ourselves so that we can hear it and then make decisions that come out of listening to it, we have a chance to bring our lives back on a better course. Now, is that going to change the economic system that is driven by greed and power, money, <clears throat> efficiency? No, we're going to have to do a lot more than that. We're going to have to organize, we're going to have to get together in communities just like men and women did in the beginning in the union movement when they found that one worker had no say in a company, but when 10 or 100 workers got together they could have a say. Is it going to be easy to listen to the call of our body and the call of our soul and the call of our children to come back home? No. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, it's easy. It's going to start with the breath. It's going to start with closing our eyes and shutting down the stimulus that's coming at us, the stimuli that's just so so overwhelming. And then going inside and noticing what's really going on. 
And it may be a exhaustion. It may be a profound sense of sadness. It may be a desire to be silly, just to jump up and run outside and run around and roll down a hill of grass, but it will be authentic. And so when I talk about attachment and bonding, I'm really talking about the roots of the most authentic form of connection and love that resonates with every part of our body and with the human heart and with our intuition. And that will bring us back to sanity. And I think I'm going to leave it at that for today. I would like to ask if there's anything that I said that got you thinking about something or that just resonated, you know, in your gut or your heart. And this is a time for us to, to talk about it. Um, so who would like to go first? I can go. Okay. Ready. So what's your name? Noelle. Hi, Noelle. Hi. My question is, um, how do you think we as a country can get back to connecting with nature and being more communally based and caring about what we eat, etc. Well, my sense is because it has so much to do with the hardwiring of the brain to either being in a state of fear and defense or being in a state of, a, of trust and uh, curiosity and creativity that I would start there. I would start with how we actually treat women when they're pregnant mm -hmm. and even pre-pregnant and how we can move birth out of the hospital except for rare instances and turn hospital birth that's necessary into sanctuaries for birth where people take off their normal shoes where they're caring for a woman and they put on slippers and mm -hmm. their voices are hushed and mm -hmm. she has the privacy she needs and the low, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can, you know what a sanctuary would feel like. So I would say we start there. We start with not frightening our mothers mm -hmm. and not stressing our women and our mothers. And of course that also means we've got to make it possible for women to bear children only if they want to and only when. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are still seeing a very large percentage of males wanting to control women's bodies mm -hmm. and, um, and how many children they have and when and if and mm -hmm. so on. So I would say it starts with how we wire the brain and the human heart. And that has to do with those first 18 months from even preconception, because mm -hmm. now we know that uh, when the biological father is under a lot of stress in the last weeks of pregnancy, that stress gets passed on to his sperm, it expresses in his sperm, and the resulting child, if it's a boy, will have a harder time dealing with stress mm. than it would if dad was not mm -hmm. under a lot of stress. And that stress might be drugs or work or any number of things. I also think that we have to start naming what it is we want. If we don't know what we want, it's very hard to get it. Absolutely. So just the fact that you can name it, that you'd like food that is healthy and nourishing and is connected to the earth and maybe, you know, the family farms and as opposed to these huge monoculture Right. Uh, industrialized farms, which is what we have grown used to. When you can name that, then you can start to think, well, what, what would that be like for me? Does that mean living in a city and having an urban garden or being part of a community that has an urban garden? Or does it mean we really need to move to a different place or I need right. to move to a different place? Um, 
it's difficult particularly because we're constantly being bombarded with messages that we're not good enough unless we buy this mm -hmm. or do that or take this drug or you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I've known people who've made decisions such as uh, to give up the family car and to move closer to the place of work for the person who's going to be going back to work the soonest and take a tiny apartment and get hand-me-down furniture in order to be able to spend more time with the kids, time with the babies. Mm -hmm. um, running completely counter to what the culture says. And I remember a young man who was raised by two artists, parents in Italy, who were home virtually all the time because they were working artists. And he made the decision that he wanted to be with his child when he had this child with his wife. And, uh, and the all the decisions they made were related to what would give them time. What would give them time together and time with that child? And they just simplified, simplified, simplified. And in the midst of a busy city, they were leading this kind of life. And the decisions flowed from there. But it's not that easy mm -hmm. because things have been set in motion. You know, we've made decisions about jobs. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a, a, a very good res piece of research done that was uh, about when both parents go back to work when a child is a baby or a toddler. And it found that actually it was less costly for one person to stay home till the child was the age of four than for both parents to go to work because the extra clothes they had to buy, the transportation, the food, mm -hmm. the eating meals out, including the junk food that they ate for instant gratification, mm -hmm. um, Daycare. the cost of childcare or babysitting made it actually cost more wow. to go back to work. But nobody ever promoted that story, you know? So Any more than, well, it, it's an example of what uh, a wonderful physician researcher named Michelle O'Dont um, calls cul-de-sac research. It's research that gets put in a little byway and never listened to because mm. it doesn't match the values of the culture. Mm. And I'll give you another example. Another example <clears throat> came from a Harvard study, a very long-term study on childcare um, and putting kids in, in daycare. And um, what was shown on the press and in the newspaper and on radio, television, was that kids who were in daycare did better in school than kids who weren't. But when you looked at the study, what you discovered was that for every month a child was in full day daycare, starting in infancy, it showed an increase in aggressive behavior, which came right out in kindergarten and first grade, and especially above boy, about boys. Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody wanted to, to see that. That was not the result we wanted to get. We, you know, we like competition. We like aggression. We only want it to be in certain places at certain times. But that's the culture that we've created. It's a big warrior culture. It's not a culture based on human happiness and full thriving. So. I guess that's the first thing I'd say is it's going to be difficult because mm -hmm. you're going to have this disconnect probably between the life you want to lead and what you are leading. Mm -hmm. And the more you can tolerate the fact that these two don't match up and you've named what you mu want, mm -hmm. the more you'll be able to move in that direction. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. It's, it's not the quick fix right, absolutely. that people would say. Thing with this kind of thing. But if you want, I'll give you a sheet of paper that has six things you should do. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question. What's your name? Sydney. Hi, Sydney. Hi, Suzanne. Um, I'd have to say one of the things that really struck a chord with me was when you were talking about being detached from your body and I feel 
that when ever since I was younger I realized that I detached myself whenever I felt just like a lot of emotions going on or negativity and I feel like I did that probably until this last two or three years <clears throat> and so I guess I'm just like I've been so used to not being in touch with my body like how do you go about like reconnecting with your body because I feel like when I have reconnected it's been like like there's this backup of energy for years and years and years and it kind of just like it's too much sometimes yeah I'm hearing you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and that backup of energy can come out as rage. Mm -hmm. It can come out as crying and mm -hmm. feeling like you'll never stop crying. Uh, yeah. And it can be pretty scary. It can mm -hmm. feel like if you let yourself go down into this, it's a bottomless pit. Whew. So, I guess the first thing I would say is bravo for noticing. For whatever it was that got you to wake up to the fact that there was a disconnect between what your body was telling you and what you were allowing, you know, yourself mm -hmm. to feel. <sighs> Often that results in a lot of sadness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Was it was it symptoms in your body, chronic symptoms that made you notice, or do you feel like saying anything about what woke you up? Um, I think I was noticing that I was just really detached, um, like not being able to feel good things like I used to be able to as easily, and so I was, yeah, realizing that something is definitely disconnected. So you noticed a numbness. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, that starts very, very young mm -hmm. in many of us. Um, when our feelings and emotions were not received well when we were really little, which could have been when we were babies, it could have been in preschool, it could have been in kindergarten. Often it's a repeated pattern, you know, that we, we want to be appreciated. Everybody wants to be seen and appreciated. And when we notice the look in our mother's eyes or our father's that said, mm -hmm. uh, we got an instant message that that was not going to get us what we needed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a a way in which, because children are so keyed into the people giving them their primary care, the people communicating with them all the time, that um, they're always looking, even if it's just out of the corner of their eye, right? And, and they can tell, and they learn. We, children, as babies, learn what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. In, in very much the same way that children are born with the capacity to speak any language, to speak any sound, including the clicking language in Africa, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not that they learn different sounds, it's that the ones that aren't used, they can't remember. So they get extinguished. It's like there's... In neurologically, there's certain times in the, the life of the brain when it does what's called pruning, like pruning a tree, mm -hmm. and it just cuts loose those things that have not been used. Mm -hmm. So, if we learn very early on that certain emotions are not acceptable, uh, in, in, in my case, with my mother, who was feeling so overwhelmed living with a man who'd come back from World War II, her husband, who had enormous PTSD and a lot of rage, and uh, who was such a handful for her, um, I had to be a good child. 
in order to make her life easy. And I learned that very early on, you know. I, there were, the, the emotions that were unacceptable were rage, sadness, um, yeah, those are the big ones, rage and sadness. Mm -hmm. And so I learned to, to stuff them. And you can only do that so long before stuff cart, you know, starts backing up, mm -hmm. as you said. And then you feel like you open up a little and this floodgate yeah. comes out. Um, and if it happens to be coming out at someone you love and someone you live with, you've really got to explain that mm -hmm. this isn't about you. Mm -hmm. This is, this is my stuff, and, and I know I need to deal with it, but I would sure like a hug, or mm -hmm. I can go take a walk, or I'm going to go to bed and cry, but um, when I feel this way, if I say I'm going to go to bed and cry for a bit, in the back of my mind is really, is he going to come after me and hold me? And... If you got messages early on in your life that if you behaved certain ways you got affection and if you behaved other ways you didn't, then it's unlikely that you would choose people in your life who were going to give you the very things that you needed. That's a whole nother <laughs> discussion, but it's how we choose partners mm -hmm. unconsciously to give us a chance to work with the issues we never fully dealt with. Which is why, you know, you fall in love with someone who reminds you of all the good qualities of the mother or father that you had. And only six months later, after you've committed to them, uh, do you notice that they also had the bad traits? <laughs> <laughs> all of the bad traits. Mm -hmm. And um, I really, I think there's a lot of evidence that the, the wisdom of the body, the wisdom of our of our psyche, which is really our soul, is such that it will draw to us people who will bring up those issues again so we have a chance to heal them. But if you don't have a partner who thinks that way, um, it's hard to do the work. So it's a long-winded way of saying you're on the right path and it's going to be very rocky and feel messy a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And anything that you can do to express it in ways that are creative, drawing, painting, singing, putting on loud music and mm -hmm. dancing, you know, shaking your body out, yeah. um, is going gonna, is gonna to help. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I used to have those kinds of uh, floodgates open when I would go to conferences about birth <laughs> and it would recapitulate or bring up again the stuff that happened in my birth and in, in, in my case it was a very traumatic birth and doctor wouldn't come and the nurse was going to lose her job if she allowed me to be born. This was 1944 and so she pushed on my head and pushed it back with every contraction, held my mother's legs together and my uterus is pushing me out and and this hand is pushing me back. Well, when I get under too much pressure, I start to freak. Even something like preparing these classes. So if it would happen at a conference, you know, and I bring a booth to have an exhibit for the nonprofit I have, inevitably I would go into rage, you know, all kinds of stuff, and it would start building up in me, and I'd have to flee to the hotel room, and then I'd have to bury my face in the pillows and start screaming into the pillow, thinking I was completely insane. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I was doing was releasing trauma, and, um, you know, or taking a towel and doubling it over and just beating on, on the mattress or on, on a chair to make that cracking sound, you know, which would release some of the tension in my body. If we were animals, we'd have a much easier time. We are animals, but I mean, if we were animals like um, deer or horses, uh, we would release it physically, and we would shake, and we would run, and, mm -hmm. but we are civilized, so we, we just sit there and feel this. <clears throat> so I would say do as much physical stuff as you can. Yeah. And that's now what they tell people who are 
called first responders, firefighters, ambulance people who go to the scene of an accident, anybody that has this kind of shock they have to deal with, mm -hmm. that within 24 hours they have to do vigorous, vigorous physical labor in order to sweat and get it out of them. But I think it's not just that. I think they need to vocalize. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll just put on loud music. If mm -hmm. Bob isn't here and, you know, yeah. And so I can feel comfortable doing it. Close the doors, put on loud music, and just shout and scream. Ah, and that does get a lot of it out of our tissues because mm -hmm. it's held. It's traumatic to hold back our feelings mm -hmm. year after year after year. And it is held in our bodies, and then we have to release it from our bodies. Is that a help? Yeah, that helps a lot. A okay. lot. Okay. <laughs> What's your name? My name is Flora. Hi, Flora. Hi. And my, what? And it doesn't have to be a question. It can just be a observation or something you're thinking. Well, that's what stayed with me was um, my first two children were um, natural, and then my second two, because of um, progression and labor, had to be C-section, and I can see the difference in their personalities. Um, Interesting. It just really clicked because my husband is not the father of my older two. And so he'd say, well, what do you do with your other children? You know, when a certain stage in the younger children is coinciding, I'm like, they just did what I asked them. They didn't argue back. They didn't question motives. They just did what they were told. They trusted, I guess it was a trust issue, they trusted what I was telling them and they would listen, where um, the C-section babies always question everything. There's always a question behind why we're asking them something of them. Did you, did you get to breastfeed? Mm -hmm. All of them? Yes. Okay. And did you get, after the cesarean, did you get to have skin-to-skin -skin time with the babies alone? Just, you know, chest-to-chest? -chest? It was longer. It or took it a long longer, time to yeah, get it. It was longer to get that because of the C-section. I was in recovery. And so um, they did bond more with their dad, which um, I appreciate because he shares in that um, raising of them. Mm -hmm. It's not me doing all the raising. It's both of us. Mm -hmm. But you see the imprint mm -hmm. of different kinds of birth. Yeah. Yes. You know... It's complex because different children come into the world with different amounts of resilience or ability to tolerate uh, adversity or stress. So you can have two kids in the same situation. One will respond one way and one will respond another. That's partly their innate temperament. And then it's partly what was the pregnancy like? Because, of course, there's nine months of pregnancy and how much stress you had then. And then it's partly... Um, it's partly the things that happen to them, like the separation, like the drugs, like the lack of stimulation in the labor. Um, were they, did you have much labor for both of them? Um, the last two? The seven-year-old was about four hours. I was induced because he was nine days late. Uh-huh. And so it went pretty quick, but... I spent two hours trying to push him out because he was a really big child. His head circumference was really big. So you had about four hours labor and then about two hours of pushing and then they did a cesarean? Mm -hmm. And um, because what, they said he wasn't descending? Yeah, he never got a cone head. He never went into the birth canal. He wasn't ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, nine days is not that, <laughs> you know, if you want to get into um, obstetric practices, we tell people it's uh, you're nine days, quote, late. But in fact, it isn't a due date. It's a due month from three and a half, you know, two, two to three weeks before the so-called date to two to three weeks afterwards. So he probably wasn't ready to come and was pissed is part of what I'm saying, you know. Um, and the other one? Um, it was just scheduled. It was scheduled. So then that was because you'd had the cesarean before. Even though you'd had two natural births, you were told you had to have a cesarean. Well, they gave, we tried to have them 
and stay smaller. I ate less carbs to keep him a little smaller, but his head circumference was still too big, and so we just scheduled that. Was his head that much bigger than the other, the first two? Probably not. Well, the first, he was, it was the 15 inch circumference, and then um, the last one was a 14 inch, where the other two were 12 inches. Most women's bodies can accommodate that. Uh, in fact, women who have vaginal births after cesarean, often when the cesarean has been done for what's called CPD or cephalopelvic disproportion, the head is too big for the pelvis, mm -hmm. most of the women will have a larger baby the next time vaginally, which completely oh. runs counter to what mm -hmm. they said. But that is modern obstetrics. And, you know, I saw when you said I had to have cesarean, I was looking at you and thinking, okay, love to see what the actual record was mm -hmm. and what were the physiological reasons possibly as opposed to what was hospital protocol or what was the doctor comfortable with. Well, they had already broken my water also. So because they'd ruptured the membranes, they felt that they didn't want to let you be more than... 24 hours or whatever. You could see how one thing leads to another leads to another and then you get told I needed the cesarean but in fact if the first intervention hadn't occurred and you hadn't had labor induced all of those other things wouldn't have followed. Mm -hmm. So this isn't to say that the temperament of the boys mm -hmm. is going to stay this way um, but it is, it is important for us to understand that the circumstances of our labors and our births and our pregnancy have a great deal to do with whether certain innate potential traits that we call genetic traits get switched on or switched off. They're called express. You know, is this trait going to express itself? Is this trait going to not express itself? And, um, and that has more to do with environmental factors, including the stress of the mother, including, you know, what happens over the course of her pregnancy, including the conception itself, than just the genetic potential. So that's called epigenetics. That's the factors that have to do with shaping the genes. Yeah. So I don't want to give a pat answer because it may not be true for each of those boys and they also are very different. One of them had no labor and one of them had a short period of labor and a long period of pushing. But the more we recognize that these things matter, the more we will have the courage to get a second opinion and say, well, you know, which is very difficult to do when you're already in labor. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. and you've chosen a physician and you didn't, you know, for whatever reason, you didn't end up going to a midwife who would have felt comfortable. Oh, no, I was seeing a midwife. And was it a nurse midwife? No. Southwest midwife? Oh, so, so you went to a midwife. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back again because I don't want to name it as a particular practice. Um, so some of it has to do with the practitioner that you chose who feels comfortable with certain things and not others. Oh. And, and then some of it has to do with hospital policy. And I could do a couple days talk on why hospitals are not designed for patients and, <laughs> and how birth, birth really doesn't belong in hospitals except in, in state of real emergency. Mm -hmm. That for the most part, birth can be done outside the hospital. Um, did I make some sense? Yes. yes really? Yeah. Give you a few more things to think about. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got their, their potential temperament, mm -hmm. and that combines with the environmental factors that happened, you know, what happened from conception on through the birth and after. And then you've got afterwards, and then the years afterwards with how we respond to them, how they respond to us, and that's why it's so difficult to just say, well, one thing caused that. But you, as a mom, know that your cesarean boy babies were not as easy to settle as your vaginal birth babies that had no drugs. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Anything else that you know, we're talking about the body and the language of the body. 
There's so much to talk about attachment. Um, the wonderful news really is that there is healing at any time. I guess that's the most important thing to say, mm -hmm. that for many of us, we didn't get what we really needed at different phases of our development, particularly in the first 18 months from conception to nine months, and then in the next 18 months. And that doesn't mean we can't rework it, we can't do a lot of remediation, but it's diff it, the longer we wait to do it, the harder it is, because mm -hmm. the more set our patterns are neurologically. And on the other hand, there's so many different forms of healing that we now have that we didn't have even 36 years ago, 46 years ago, from body healing to art therapy, dance therapy, to homeopathics, to craniosacral work, to work out in nature. We're learning from the amount of trauma that we have created many, many ways of dealing with trauma and healing it. And my desire is to see that we prevent a whole lot of it. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say one other thing about mm -hmm. the body. Um, you hear a lot about PTSD or um, post-traumatic stress and the different alphabets that go with it. Uh, there's been enough research now to show that the men and women who have the most problems that are we now call PTSD, the most symptomatic problems with trauma, are those who had early trauma, very early trauma. And when it wasn't, especially when it wasn't addressed or healed. So let's say a baby who was the result of a forced conception. Dad was drunk, forced himself on the mom. Let's say she was under a high stress pregnancy, she didn't want to carry that baby, and she was ambivalent most of the time, she had no option, abortion wasn't available to her, or if it was, she wasn't able to do it because of her religion or family, whatever. Mm -hmm. And let's say she had a really difficult birth, let's say the baby was premature and spent six weeks in the nursery. Now, all of those things are traumatic. And a person who had that background, who is in combat, is much less resilient and much less likely, especially if it's a boy, because boys are more vulnerable to trauma than our girls, much less likely to throw it off and much more likely to have PTSD. Mm -hmm. So we have to really look at what we're doing as a society mm -hmm. in continuing to perpetrate um, abuse, and whether that abuse is abuse of women, abuse of children, or abuse called war. Uh, we have been taught that we need to accept these things as part of life, and it isn't so. And the good news is, usually, we can heal it anyway, but it takes a lot of effort, and often takes a lot of time. I could take one more if there's anything that And it may be that this is like enough <laughs> flooding. It is a lot to keep in yeah. mind, but not over. Mm -hmm. I usually suggest when people start thinking about these kinds of issues that um, they drink a lot of water in the next 24 hours, mm -hmm. that they get outside, that they see what they can do in terms of being in water, taking a shower. Mm -hmm taking a, a bath with Epsom salts and lavender oil in it or something. Mm -hmm. But in other words, just really let a lot of this go and not necessarily try and talk about it mm -hmm. uh, or put words to it until, um, until it is settled mm -hmm. in your body. It's kind of like a, a, a shoot of a little little plant yeah. that is trying to grow and needs some moisture and some quiet before it can plant its, its uh, roots deeply enough. Really? And if, mm -hmm. if anything I said really uh, bears thinking about, it will come back to you mm -hmm. in a week or two. I'm so grateful you were here.
Okay, it's a good here. Thank you.